Okay. Cheers, Mark. What happened? All right, we are in book of Genesis, chapter 15. Genesis chapter 15 plays a very, very important role where God reconfirms his covenant with Abraham or Abram. His name is not changed yet. His name is Abram. And uh, let's look at verse 1. I really love uh, the story of Abraham. Now we need to remember. Abram is called the father of faith. <clears throat> yes. He is called the father of faith. But how did his faith life begin? You know when the disciples asked Jesus in Luke 17 and 3. They said increase our faith. So it means to say in a believer's life the faith increases. Day by day, year by year the faith increases. That is exemplified in the life of Abram. Now this man Abram, he is called the father of faith. But please remember that he was not a man of faith from the beginning. Of course, he put in his faith in God. That's why he started his journey. But he did not become the father of faith overnight. It was over a period of time. How do we know that? Chapter 15 verse 1. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. This is God coming and talking to Abram. And what does he say? Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield and your very great reward. Let's try to analyze this. God says, I am your very great reward. See, you get a reward or you get an award. But here God says, I'm not going to give you a reward which is outside me, but I am your reward. So let's try to put it this way. You know, I like to illustrate, so let me put it this way. Let's say there is a prize distribution going on. And people are getting their rewards. One after another, one after another. That is when Abram's name is called. Abram comes to the stage and stands there waiting for his prize, waiting for his reward. And God is standing next to Abram. And Abram's eyes are around looking for what am I going to get? What am I going to get? And that's when God tells Abram, Abram, you stretch out your hands. You'll get your reward. Abram stretches out his hands. You know what God does? God comes and lays himself in those arms. And looks at Abram and says, Abram, I am your reward. What else does a man require more than that? God himself says, Abram, I am your reward. If God did that to you, what would you say? Wow, I am blessed man. I got everything in life. Yes or no? Look at what Abram did. God said, Abram, I am your very great reward. Verse 2. But, you see that? But, Abram said, O sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless? And the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus. What is he trying to say? What is the use of you being my reward because I don't have a son? Now tell, if you hear such a statement, what, on a scale of 0 to 10, where do you put this man's faith? God, the creator of the universe, the king of kings and the lord of lords, he's telling him, Abraham, I'm your reward. When Abram, in, in, in this Genesis 15, when God says, I am your reward, Abram says, so what? So what? I don't have a son. Materialistic thinking. 
faith doesn't take you faith takes you beyond the materialistic thinking but here you see he begins with materialistic materialistic outlook okay then what does god do see when a man comes into a confusion or man comes into a doubtless situation god always will try to help you come out of that place and put your trust in him how do we know that verse 4 then the word of the lord came to him this man will not be your heir who is this man eliezer will not be your heir but a son coming from your own body will be your heir he took him outside can you see the language god took abram outside they are living in a tent and god holds abram's hand takes him out and what does he do he said look up at the heavens and count the stars if indeed you can count them then he said to him so shall your offspring be this verse verse 6 is quoted in romans chapter 4 what is that abram believed the lord and he credited to him as righteousness okay now can you define him as the father of faith hold on don't be hasty look at the next concept verse 7 he said i am the lord who brought you out of the ur of the chaldeans to give you this land to take possession of it the next thing god says is you will have a son right remember god gave a promise to abram at two levels one was the promise of the son or the promise of a seed and the promise of the land promise of the seed and the promise of the land now the promise of the land is coming up now god says i will give you this land you know what abram says verse 8 but abram said oh sovereign lord how can i know that i will gain possession of it you see he's a <laughs> he's a slow learner you call him see when god says i am your reward he says so what i don't have a son god says i will give you this land he says how will i know i'll get it right that's usually how a person's faith journey starts we know this man came to a point when he took the knife was about to kill his only son on the mountain did not hesitate if you want to really know the beautiful faith journey the growth in the faith journey abram is the best example let's go ahead okay god chose him and then gives him a promise that after 400 years these uh, verse 13 then the lord said to him no for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own and they will be enslaved and mistreated for 400 years and then they will come back okay they'll be com- they'll come back verse 16 in the fourth generation your descendants will come back here for the sin of the amorites has not yet reached its full measure okay there are two parts to this verse i want to talk now the first part is in the fourth generation your descendants will come back here what is he talking about he is talking about what is the next fourth generation we are talking about joseph abram isaac jacob joseph in the during the time of joseph what happened these people came out of after joseph uh, 120 plus years they came to they were in egypt right they were in egypt from egypt they all came back with the help of moses so that's the fourth generation he's talking about when they came out with uh, moses out into the promised land the second part is your descendants will come back here for second part for the sin of the amorites has not yet reached its full measure where is he living he is living in the land of the amorites okay but why is god not destroying those people right now because their sin has not reached its full measure please remember one thing nobody can judge or decide for god's timing there is something that man cannot have control over and that is his time nobody can control that the other part is the judgment of god was not coming on these people right now when you look at the things that are going in new york last year we were talking about 
or maybe not last year, maybe say six months ago, we were talking about, see what's happening in uh, New York City. They have legalized gay marriages. People are going there getting married. Did you watch the news yesterday? In our own city, in Oklahoma City, a motion was passed in the Oklahoma City Council permitting what? Jobs without discrimination, like the equal opportunity, and now they added another phrase of what? Without any prejudice on sexual orientation. The pastor was Windsor, Windsor Hill Baptist Church pastor. He was praying and they said, don't do this, God's wrath will come upon you. What happened? They went ahead and passed the motion. And then after that, you heard somebody saying what? You don't threaten us with God. Now the question is, the people who are watching this, what's the response? Looks like God's defeated. Right? There's another pastor in Edmund. He has received threatening calls. We'll be your guest in your service this Sunday. They said all sorts of things to this man. They're threatening this man's life. And please remember this, whatever I'm talking now, is going on to the YouTube. Okay? So you, 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 you don't, think, don't think that I'm going to cut this and then put it somewhere else. This is the question I ask for people. This is the question I ask the people who believe in same-sex marriages. Let's put it this way. Let there be homosexuality throughout America. Let it be all over the country. But there should be no union between a man and a woman for the next hundred years. Let's have homosexuality in this country for 100 years, but no man and woman should physically meet. No copulation for the next 100 years. Tell me what's going to happen to this country. Why did God say man and woman then? Because there is no other way of proliferation of the human race. There's no progeny without God's plan, God's way of working. One, after hundred years, if you follow this procedure, you know one day in the newspaper you will read this. Once upon a time, there was America. You'll hear this. You'll read this. They cannot reproduce, but they can only recruit children. And what is God's promise? Go and multiply. And He also said how they should multiply. When God made a helper for Adam, He made Eve. And God is a superhuman, super intelligent being. You cannot challenge God's wisdom. We were talking about these things happening in some other part of the world. We have it right in our own city. Now the question is, why is not God punishing? The answer is here. Look at verse 16. For the sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. But is God going to judge? Yes, He's going to judge. Okay, let's move on. Chapter 16. Chapter 16, this is where you find Sarah giving, Sarai giving an advice to her husband. Okay, the advice is what? Uh, I don't think we're going to have kids, right? But, why don't you uh, go and sleep with my maidservant? Perhaps I can build a family through her, Hagar. Now, where did Hagar come from? Where did Hagar come from? She came from Egypt. Remember, they went down to Egypt. Genesis 13, uh, I think Genesis uh, uh, 12 and verse 10. Abraham went down to Egypt. From there, they picked up a girl to help her in the household. And then, 
Sarah says, I mean, I really don't understand Sarah's logic. I don't understand her logic. See, there are two people here. Abram and Sarah. Abram is 90 years old, or 75 years old at this time, and she's 65. And she thinks she is not capable of producing a child. I don't understand how she thinks that her husband will be capable of producing a child. <laughs> okay? She has his own thinking and she says, okay, go and sleep with my maidservant. And then, what does she realize? This girl is pregnant. This girl is pregnant. And therefore, she starts despising her mistress. And this is what I understand. You know, because of that, Sarah started mistreating this girl. Happens? Yeah. She started mistreating her. What's the result? This girl, Hagar, ran away. Hagar ran away from Sarai. And this is what verse 7 says. If you have your pens with you, just underline it. This is what I was talking to you, uh, Jean. The angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert. It was a spring that is beside the road to Shur. Who found Hagar? The angel of the Lord found Hagar. What was the condition of Hagar? She is running away. Where is she going? She doesn't know. She has had a bad experience. With this bad experience, she is going away somewhere and that's when the angel of the Lord found Hagar. What do you think this is? Can somebody tell me what this is? What do you understand from this? Can you give me one word for this? It starts with a G, ends with an L. This is nothing but the gospel. When a person is lost and the angel of the Lord found him, that is exactly what you find in Luke 19.10. What's that? The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Where is the, what is the condition of this woman Hagar? She's lost. And the angel of the Lord found it. The next statement is so powerful. Look at this. And he said, verse 8, Hagar, servant of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? This is again nothing but gospel. Where are you? Where have you come from and where are you going? I don't know if you have some conversations with the people who are not saved. If you say, I don't know what questions to ask them, I can give you many questions. One of the questions is this one. Do you know where you're going after you die? I tell you, we had a very great experience last week. We were coming from Dallas. We went for the meeting and at night around say 9.30 or so we were driving back. And there is a live show, live program on uh, the radio in Dallas. And as we were driving back, I was, think, I was looking for this number for a long time. I didn't get it. But that day I got it. And then I typed in the number and then I called this live show. In this live show, you can ask questions. And the question I asked was, what happens to a person when he dies? And to my amazement, you know what? That guy received that guy received the question. And all the people in Dallas heard my question. There was a discussion for nearly 35 minutes on this question. This man wants to go to the next question. People are not allowing him to go. They said, I want to answer that question. Somebody said, when you die, you become a devil. Somebody says, death is the best thing. Then somebody says, let's not talk about death at all. Then somebody says, you are either buried or you are cremated. Nothing happens beyond that. And somebody said, there is an afterlife. I tell you, just ask this question to somebody. What do you think happens to you after you die? <laughs> you probably might change their life. God will work and then he might change. And people will be interested to answer such questions. The angel asked Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? 
All those who accepted Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, they know where they are going. Today I know where I am going. Even if I drop dead right now, I know where I will be. That's the hope that we have as Christians. That when we die, we will be in the presence of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. But there are so many people outside those who don't know this. Those who don't know where they are going. Okay, so this is one good question that she was asked. And then she said, I am running away from my mistress, Sarai. Then God is confirming a promise to uh, Hagar. What does it say? Verse 10, the angel added, I will so increase your descendants that they will be too numerous to count. Le- 11, you are now with a child and you will have a son. You will name him Ishmael. What's the name? What's the meaning of the word Ishmael? You know what's the meaning of the word Ishmael? God hears. God hears. For the Lord has heard of your misery. He will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone and everyone's hand against him and he will live in hostility toward all his brothers. Who are we talking about? The Muslim world is come from Ishmael. It's come from Ishmael. Why is there so much of conflict up there? In Israel and Palestine and all these. Why are there so many wars? 1966. Six day war. Why the Muslim nation should get together? Because God already said that. He already said that. Okay. What happened? Verse 15. So Hagar bore, she went back. She went back to Sarai. She, uh, so Hagar bore Abram a son and Abram gave him the name Ishmael to the son she had born. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore him Ishmael. Okay. Hagar bore him Ishmael and what's uh, at the age of what? At the age of 86. So at the age of 85, uh, probably that's when, uh, he was not 75, when uh, Abram's um, and uh, Hagar, they had a union, Abram was 85. So at 86 you find this is what's happening. Okay, 86, this man, uh, this boy, Ishmael is born. Okay. The next thing that you hear immediately after this is chapter 17 and verse 1. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, Okay, what do you think happened in between? At the age of 86, when Abram was 86, Ishmael was born. When Abram was 99 years old, then the Lord spoke to him. This tells us, That the God who spoke to Abram between 75 and 85 at multiple times did not speak to Abram for 13 long years. For 13 years God did not speak to this man. We can be very quick to find mistakes with Abram. But this is what I want to ask. Are you and I in the same position like Abram where we have not the, heard the voice of God? Let me put it this way. When was the last time that you heard God speaking to you? I'm not talking about attending the church. I'm not talking about uh, coming to a Bible study. I'm asking... When was the last time God spoke to you? Does God speak? Yes, He does. The question is, did you hear Him speaking to you personally? I can tell you, with all honesty, God spoke to me this morning while I was taking shower. God reminded me and comforted me. Some people try to cause harm to me. You know what happened? God reminded me, Romans 8, 28, all things work together for the good of those that love Him. I look back and see, you know what? All that has turned out to be a blessing. 
And who told me that? It's God who gave me the thought and said, You see, some people tried to harm you, but you see, it all turned out to be a blessing to you. And I was sharing with Alan this before the service. Do you understand why I'm so quiet and so why I'm so calm? It's because God has given me assurance. God's spoken to me. And that's why I'm not disturbed, I'm not confused. Now, does God speak to you uh, on a monthly basis? Or does it, is He like a news reader at 9 o'clock every night? He can speak to you anytime. Anytime. But here, God did not speak to Abram for 13 long years. Why? Is the question. Now we are coming to heading home. Why didn't God speak to this man for 13 years? Because from between 75 and 85, God been speaking to him several times. Why did he not speak for 13 years? You know why? Because Abram went out of God's way. Ishmael was not God's plan. Now, another question you may get is, why couldn't God stop Abram? Right? The same question takes us back to the Garden of Eden. Why couldn't God stop him? Uh, stop Eve from eating that fruit or Adam from eating that fruit. You know what God will do? He is a gentleman. He will never interfere with your choice. He will give you caution. But he will not interfere with your free will. And here... Let me ask, let, let's go back to that story. When Sarah said, go and sleep with my uh, servant, don't you think Abram could have said, Sarah, I think what you're talking is nonsense. See, God told us, right? Why do you want me to go and sleep with this girl? God's made a promise and He will. He could have easily said, you know what happened? He didn't do that. The result, what's the result? I mean, today also we are facing that problem. That's one thing. On the other hand, the worst part I think for Abraham is what? He has 13 dark years in his life when God did not speak. Now, when a person falls into such a situation, does God abandon such people? And the earth was void and dark, what do you find there? The Spirit of God was hovering over it. That's what a good news is. Even though Abram made a mistake, God did not judge him and cast him away. You know what he did? Verse 1, chapter 17, verse 1. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. I will confirm my covenant between me and you. And will greatly increase your numbers. One fine day, after 13 years, when Abram was sitting there, he suddenly heard God's voice. What is Abram's response to this? After 13 years, you hear somebody's voice. How do you, how do you react? You hear somebody's voice after 13 years. You have never spoken to that person this for these last 13 years you hear this person how excited you would be and look at what Abram did Abram fell face down and God said to him when he heard the voice of God he fell face down my question is another step we need to ask here is when God speaks to you did you fall face down when God speaks to you and speaks to your heart, what we do is sometimes we just brush it off. We think it's not for me. We just try to postpone. But the good response is to fall face down. Abram did that. Abram did that. Okay, what happened now? What do you think happened now? The fellowship is restored. The fellowship is restored. Now, 
God says, I am going to change your name. Your name is not Abram anymore. Your name will be what? Abraham. Verse 5. Yeah, that's where the ham came from. Is it not? No. Okay. Abram. The meaning of the word Abram is exalted father. The meaning of the word Abraham is father of many. Is the meaning. Father of many nations. He said, he promised him, right? See, God even changed his name defining his promise. Okay. Then what do you find here? God said, I will give you this promise. And then, this is how He said, you have to prove yourself that you belong to Me. What's that? Circumcision. Circumcision. Verse 9. Then God said to Abram, As for you, you must keep My covenant, you and your descendants, after you for the generations to come. My question is this. How can a human keep up the covenant of God? God can keep up His covenant, but how can a man keep up His covenant? Very simple. Obey and do what He tells you. What was that? Circumcision. Now, let me ask you a question. What is this man? What is the age of this man now? 86. Have you ever heard anybody who is 86 getting circumcised? Secondly, No, he's still 86. Oh, 99. Yes, yeah, sorry, he's 99. Yes, 86. 86 when his son was born. At 99, yeah, I'm sorry. At 99, I was looking at 8 days there. So, at 99, now this man has to be circumcised. Okay? Now, verse 12. For the generations to come, every male among you who is 8 days old must be circumcised. See, Eight days old getting circumcised is alright. But now here is a 99 year old man. Now, you know what? You, what is easy to say? Lord, let's put it this way. From my next generation on, we'll try to do this. Right? You could negotiate. But this man said, Lord, I am ready. I am ready to do whatever you want me to do to keep up your covenant. The covenant brings the relationship. Covenant brings the fellowship. And God, Abram was ready to have that relationship. And God said, verse 14, Any uncircumcised male who has not been circumcised in the flesh will be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. Now let's talk about what is, what is the meaning of circumcision. Now, the meaning of circumcision here, of course, physically that is there. But to the church, what does it mean? To the church, what does it mean? Take the flesh off your spiritual life. Take the what, what happens in circumcision? You cut off the flesh. You cut off the flesh. Is it possible for a Christian to walk by flesh? Yes. Is it possible for a Christian to walk by the Spirit? Yes. So what God is trying to say is you must be a person who walks by the Spirit and not by flesh. That is a covenant that God makes with the church. That day He made a covenant with Abraham, talking about physical circumcision, to the church. You know, there are a lot of places in the Bible you find, it says, circumcision of your heart. Circumcision of your heart. What is the meaning of circumcision of heart? You would cut the flesh off the heart. And heart is the place where God has been trying to work with all your life. So God wants to take the worldliness out of you. God wants to take out the flesh out of you. And that is what brings a good relationship between a believer and God Himself. Here? No, no. This, this is every male. Yeah, but here, I mean, uh, I mean, I didn't know about that, but uh, I've never heard it. But usually it's the male, even by the promise of God. And therefore, now when you come down to uh, the church, what does Paul say? There's no male, there's no female, there's no Greek, there's no Jew, there's no Gentile. Right? This is what he says. Everybody's same. So, the primary idea for a church with respect to circumcision is, you must not live by the flesh. 
you must not live by flesh. Let me put it this way. You may ask Chandra, I mean, define what is walking by flesh and walking by spirit. Let me put it this way. In the church, this is one example, you can give many, but I'm just giving one. In the church, there are people, right? One good place where you can have a lot of manpower is people. Okay? So what did God say? God said, love the people and use the money. Yes or no? Love the people is what is important. And whatever resources you have, you use it for the people. What could happen is, you find people doing the other way. What's that? They love the money and use the people. Now in the church, can you not use a person? Very much. Now, do you want to use a person or do you want to love a person? That's important. A person who is spirit walking person, he will love the people. A person who is walking with the flesh, he will try to use the people. He will try to manipulate the people. I'm talking about believers. So we have to be very, very careful. Now, are you walking in the spirit or are you walking in the flesh is a question. I'm not, I'm not talking about people outside the church. Within the church. God says, walk by spirit. Okay, let's go ahead. Not only Abraham's name is changed, Sarah's name is changed. Now she's from Sarai, she's called Sarah. And then God said what? I'll give, you a, I'll give you a child. Again, he's reconfirming the covenant. I mean, I, I, just look at uh, Abram's response again. Verse 17, Abram fell face down. He laughed and said to himself, Will a son be born to a man 100 years old? This, I mean, this fellow is very, very, very interesting. He had a son at 86. right? He had a son at 86. Now, he is at 99 and he says, Can I have a son? Right? And then... Uh, Will Sarah bear a child at the age of 90? And Abram said to God, If only Ishmael might live under your blessing. You know what Abram is trying to say? God, you're trying to make give big promises that you'll give me a son through Sarah. Uh, I don't think it's possible. I don't think what you're saying is going to be okay. I mean, just bless, just bless Ishmael. I don't think you can give me a son. I mean, what you can do is, you know, in your capacity, just bless Ishmael. What does God say? Yes, but your wife will bear you a son. And then he says, is anything impossible? You find later God saying, is anything too hard for me? Okay, I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his descendants after him. And then he says, I will certainly bless Ishmael. Don't worry about that. I will bless Ishmael. He'll be uh, the father of 12 rulers. Verse 20, last part. He will be the father of 12 rulers. Now, where do you get these 12 rulers? You may say, Chandra, how did you say that he's a father of the Muslim world? Okay? Now, please remember that Ishmael, uh, in verse 24, you find Abram was 99 years old and when he was circumcised, and his son Ishmael was 13. So, the Muslim world also does circumcision. Did you know that? They also do the circumcision. It's not only the Jews, it's also the Muslim world. Now you may say, what about, how do you say that he is the father of the Muslim world? Bible says that God said he will become the father of 12 rulers. Where do you find these 12 rulers? Genesis chapter 25 verse 12. Genesis 25 and verse 12 to 16 you find the account of Abraham's son Ishmael. And these are the names, verse 13. These are the names of the sons of Ishmael listed in the order of their birth. Nebaioth. The first one of Ishmael, Kedar, Abdil, Mibsam, Mishma, Duma, Masa, Hadad, Tima, Jeter, Nafish, and Kedema. How many? Twelve. And these people became what? Twelve different nations. They became twelve kingdoms. So did God bless Ishmael's uh, descendants? Yes. Now the question is, why did God bless Ishmael? So much. Why did he bless him? He promised it to Hagar too, is it not? In the desert. 
He promised. Now the question is, why did he bless Ishmael also? It's because God made a promise to Abraham. I will bless your children. What does it tell you? God is a faithful God. If He tells you something, He will live by it. He will stand by it. He will fulfill it. He will bring it to pass. That's the kind of God we have. He doesn't change His word. God is not a liar. God is not a man to change, man to change His words. Whatever He said, He is going to fulfill it. That's exactly what you see here. Ishmael is blessed. Did God answer Abram's request? Yes. But he said, I will, I will bless Ishmael, no doubt about it. But I will give you a son. I will give you a son through your wife. Chapter 18, I'd like to preach usually to seniors. <laughs> this is for the seniors. Now, we all know, now at this point, we are talking about a 99 year old man. Okay? A 99 year old man. His wife is 89. Alright. Verse 1. The Lord appeared to Abraham near the great trees of Mamre, where he was sitting at the entrance to his tent in the heat of the day. Who appeared? The Lord appeared. What was Abraham's response? Abraham looked up and saw three men standing nearby. When he saw them, he called out his servants to go and receive them. Is it not? That's what the Bible says? You were. Is that what the Bible says? He hurried from the entrance to his tent to meet them and bowed low to the ground. He bowed low to the ground. Are you seeing the physical activity of a 99 year old man? He's running. Why is he running? Because he saw the Lord. He saw the Lord. There are three people who are coming. And what did he do? He went and hurried to them and greeted those people and bowed low to the ground. Okay. And he said what? You need to come home and eat. You need to come home and eat. Verse 6. Verse 6. So Abraham hurried into the tent to Sarah. Now can you just imagine? I, I want you to remember the graphics, okay? I want you to remember the graphics. A 99 year old guy is running to an 89 year old woman. Alright? So Abraham hurried into the tent to Sarah. And what did he say? Quick! He said, Get three shares of fine flour and net it and bake some bread. Now an 89 year old lady is being given these instructions. What? Quick. Right? So, what do, you, what do you mean? What do you, what do you understand that quick would mean? Right? Okay. Verse 7. Then he ran to the herd and selected a choice tender calf and gave it to a servant. What did this servant do? Who hurried to prepare it. You know what I see here? I see a whole family running, no delay. For what? To prepare a meal for the people of God. Abraham could give an excuse. I'm slow. He could have given orders to his servants. You know how many servants does he have? He had 318 trained servants born in his own house. He is not, not an ordinary man. He has 318 servants in his house born to him. In his own family. He could have just ordered these guys. 
But when God came in the form of three people, you know what happens here? He says, I want to go and serve these people. He hurried. Not only did he hurry, his, he made his wife be quick. And when the servant saw the master and his wife running and doing things in a haste, you know what did the servant do? He also hurried. Did, did somebody tell the servant to do that? I'm big into leadership. So let me tell you here. This is a beautiful example of how you lead your church. This is nothing but leading by example. Your servant will run if you run. Okay, will your servant not run if you sit in your chair and then order? He will. But here he was not told at all. The servant was not told to do anything. He was told to do something, but the way he did was, he saw his master and wanted to imitate him. He wanted to please his master. That's what you learn from this. The whole house is running. Now, 19 year old man, running and choosing a calf, running and telling his 89 year old wife, quick, make some bread. And then he goes and gives it to a servant. The servant goes, runs and prepares this curry. What do you find here? That shows the zeal. That shows the zeal that this man has. And when they were eating, what do you find? Abram stood near them, trying to serve these people. Okay. And then, again the same promise. Again the same promise. What? After they ate, they had a discussion. So after you eat, you don't just go away, right? After eating, they had a discussion. What's the discussion? Abraham, you'll have a son. You'll have a son. Verse 13, The Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh? And say, Will I really have a child now that I'm old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? You find this in Jeremiah, is it not? You find this verse in Jeremiah. But you find this in Genesis also. Is anything too hard for me? Is what the Lord says. I will return to you at the appointed time next year and Sarah will have a son. And Sarah laughed. And then what? Then the Lord said, this, then Sarah was questioned, why did you laugh? And she lied, it says. The Bible says she lied. What do you understand from this story? This part of the story. God's been telling and telling and telling and telling that He will give a son. He will give a son. Now you may say, uh, has this really happened? Has this really happened? I didn't live at that time. But I can tell you with my own experience. We were in India. And uh, there was a family. Uh, they, we were quite close. And this couple were married for nearly, I think, 18 years. 18 years. They didn't have a child. So the pastor from a Baptist church uh, was coming to visit. So they came to our house. So what we do is we take them around. We take them to different people, different uh, families, uh, houses. So me, me and my dad and my mom, we were taking uh, Pastor Moses. And we saw this lady just outside the house. So the pastor saw this woman on the road and told her. We didn't tell him anything. We didn't tell him any background. I'm a live witness to that. He came and told as this lady. We said, oh, that's, uh, that's Mrs. Uh, so-and-so. He said, oh, okay, that's so-and-so's wife. All right. Oh, they go to church and then they're Christians. And this man came, stood on the road and said, uh, you'll have a son by next year. On the road. You'll have a son by next year. Call him Samuel. And he just went away. And then we started the discussion and said, Pastor, did you know what you did just now? <laughs> they married for 18 years. They don't have a child. He said, really? Then they'll have now. Is what the pastor said. Believe me. By the time this man said, exactly one year later, they had a child. 18 years, barren. This man said, you'll have a child. They called him Samuel. He's now an engineer. This happened right in front of my eyes. Our God is a God who can do miracles. 
He can turn things around. And you know what God did with Moses, uh, uh, Abram and Isaac, uh, Abram and Sarah. Okay, let's come back, come to the next part where there is a very interesting thing going on. Verse 17. Then the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? How nice it would be if God would tell you and me what he's going to do in the future. Yes or no? Yes or no? Does God do that? Does God do that? Yes. You may say, what are you talking? When the disciples ask Jesus, tell us when these things are going to happen, when your second coming will be, did Jesus answer the question? Matthew 24 and chapter 24 and chapter 25 is what? Nothing but the Olivet Discourse. That's where Jesus told what is going to happen, how things are going to happen, <coughs> how we have earthquakes. Why do you think we have earthquakes today? In Oklahoma City. We had earthquakes last week. Why earthquakes? You know, these are all talking about what? Jesus already told them what's going to happen. Our God is a God who owns the future. Our God is a God who owns the past and the future and everything is a timeless God. And He will reveal it to His children. And this is what He's talking here. Now, I'm going to make a very powerful statement at the end of this. Okay? Please remember that. Now, then the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? Where are they? They are right now in Abraham's house. Okay? Abraham's house. And then, I'm going to tell what, why I came here for. What I came here for, I'm going to tell Abraham. And what's that? Why did they come there? They came to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. They came to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. Now this is a statement I want to make. The coming of the Lord is always a twofold purpose. The coming of the Lord is always a twofold purpose. One is to bless a group and the other one is to destroy the other group. You take this and apply to any time in the history, you will find this true. One group is blessed, the other group is destroyed. Now look at what happened. When the Lord came here, is Abraham blessed by this coming of the Lord? Yes or no? Yes. Now what's going to happen right after this? There will be fire and brimstone coming down on Sodom and Gomorrah. So one coming was a blessing to a group and the, uh, the same coming became what? A curse to the other group. Now look at Jesus Christ. When he's going to come back again, there will be one group who will be rejoicing at his coming. There will be other group who will be beating their breasts. Right? So this is what God is trying to do. And therefore, in order to... Because of his love for the people who are inside the place where they are going to perish... He's already telling this to Abraham. What? Hey, you know what? Actually we came to destroy these guys. We came to destroy these guys. Then Abraham says what? Abraham becomes an intercessor. Last Sunday in the church, in the international church, this is what we talked about. The power of intercession. The power of intercession. I shared this last uh, Sunday. Let me tell you also as a small tidbit. What is the best practical example of intercession? The best practical example of intercession. I don't want those who heard it to tell this. The best practical example of intercession is the story in Mark chapter 2 where the four people who picked up a paralyzed man and pulled the roof over and then dropped this man right in front of Jesus. That is nothing but intercession. This man is helpless. These people carrying this man want to bring him where? In front of Jesus. How does this man walk away? With healing and also with forgiveness of sins. That is what intercession can do. When Jesus was on the cross, 
The first thing he said what? Father forgive them for they know not what they do. What is that? Intercession. Abraham is a great intercessor. He's a great negotiator. No wonder all the Jews are great negotiators, right? <laughs> you find Abraham negotiating with God. God says, I'm going to destroy these people. And here you have this question, what if? Lord, what if there are 50 people who are righteous? Are you going to destroy all of them? God says, if there are 50, I won't do that. Alright, okay, next what? 45. If there are 45, I won't destroy. Okay, what about 40? No. Then what about 30? Then what about 20? What about 10? What if only 10 can be found there? He answered, for the sake of 10, I will not destroy it. When the Lord had finished speaking with Abraham, he left and Abraham returned home. My dear brothers and sisters, in the whole country of Sodom and Gomorrah, there were not even 10 righteous people. There were not even 10 righteous people. We are talking about a period which is way, 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 thousands of years back. Thousands of years back. That is how the condition of the people has been. 10 people. There's another place. There's another place where God says, you know, I will use a candle and search for the people. I will use a candle and search for the people. Let me show you. Jeremiah chapter 5 verse 1. Go up and down the streets of Jerusalem. Look around and consider. Search through her squares. If you can find but one person who deals honestly and seeks the truth, I will forgive this city. Did you hear that terrible statement from God? If there is how many? One person who deals honestly, I will forgive this city. In book of Zephaniah, he says, chapter 2, chapter 1 and verse 12, At that time I will search Jerusalem with lamps. When do you use lamps? When there's no light. You use a lamp. You, you're so focused. You want to search. What did that woman do who lost her coin? She searched the whole house. Here you find a very pathetic situation. Not even 10 people who are righteous. There's one more interesting thing I'll tell you and then we'll continue this in the next class. Okay? Chapter 19 and verse 1. The two angels arrived at Sodom. Okay? Chapter 19 and verse 1. The two angels arrived at Sodom in the evening. Where did these two come from? Remember how many people came to Abram? Three. Three. Alright? Three people came to Abram. Chapter 18 verse 33. Last verse. When the Lord had finished speaking with Abraham, He left and Abraham returned home. Out of three, how many left? How many left? One. So how many are left over? Two. Where did they go? They go and went to Sodom. Now, who are these three? Who are these three? God, Jesus, and Holy Spirit. These are nothing but three angels. Angels have the capability to take on a human form. They have a ability to take on a human form and then revert back. This is exactly what happened here. So the angels, these are the, nothing but the angels. Now you may, you may understand, you may think like this, uh, when Abraham saw the Lord and the Bible says no one can see God and no one has seen God. Then who do you think he's talking about? He's nothing but the form of An angel or angel in the form of a human. People have seen angels. Yes or no? People have seen angels. Yes or no? You don't answer. <laughs> okay. Samson's mom.
You know, there are some people who are, uh, uh, what do you say, promised, they were promised by God, and then, then the child came. Yeah? Okay, I think we need to refresh. We need to refresh. Okay, let me show you this. In Judges, in Judges, you find chapter 13. In chapter 13, this man Manoah, Manoah is there. Okay, so he says, uh, verse 20, As the flame blazed up from the altar toward heaven, the angel of the Lord ascended in the flame. Where was this angel? Talking to these people. Okay, so if you study Judges 13, you will understand that people have seen angels. Okay, and John is seen an angel in Revelation. He falls prostrate and says, and the angel says, don't worship me, worship God. So people have seen angels, and angels have the ability to take on the form of human beings also. Okay, so here if you ask me who are the three people who came to Abraham, that's where you, that's where you find the play in the word there. Chapter 18 uh, verse 1, Genesis 18, 1, the Lord appeared to Abraham. Verse 2, the, uh, Abraham looked up and saw three men standing there nearby. Verse 1, Abraham saw the Lord. Verse 2, three men standing nearby. Okay, so please don't get confused. So don't say, oh, he saw the Lord and there were three people. They're different. Okay, they're not different. So these three people actually the angels. What happened? You find later in the story in chapter 19, they are angels. There were men there, three, there were three men there, and they became angels here. And chapter 12, chapter 19 verse 12, Genesis 19 and 12. This will explain to you. This will explain to you. Okay, three verses. Three verses you must remember. Genesis 18 and 2. Genesis 18 and 2. Or 18, 1, 18, 2. 1833, 1901, and 1912. If you study these verses, you will understand who is God, and who are these angels, and who are these people. Okay? 18.1 says, the Lord appeared to Abraham. 18.2 says, he saw three men. 18.33 says, when the Lord left speaking to him, uh, was, uh, finished speaking to him, Abraham, he left. Chapter 19, verse 1, then the two angels arrived, Chapter 12, now chapter 19 verse 12. The two men said to Lot. You see that? They are angels and they are again now what? Two men. Okay, that's another different world altogether about the angels. And when we come to Hebrews, we will talk about the angels again. Okay? So what we learn from today is the coming of the Lord is for twofold purpose in this chapter. One was to bless Abraham. The other one was to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And the coming of the Lord in the future is also with the same pur purpose. Okay? Alrighty.